Um, I can't imagine having to do that to myself. Hi, my name is Dr. Jamie, and I'm an emergency medicine doctor and content creator at the Strive to Fit. Working in the emergency room is very fast paced and you see serious complications like heart attacks, strokes. Today we're gonna be looking at some do-it-yourself surgery scenes in movies and TV shows and judging how real they are. Drinking salt water is not a antidote to any of the poisons that I know of. However, it can help you throw up if you have a lot of liquid in your stomach. Trying to vomit the poison is not an unreasonable approach. If he's already having dizziness or unsteadiness, whether it's neurological or cardiovascular effects from the poison, it might actually be too late. Him putting the pads on himself as he is in ventricular tachycardia, that is exactly what I would do. Any signs of instability, I would shock them. Typically we have one pad on the front of the chest and then another one on the back so that when it delivers a shock, it really is transmitting the electrical shock through the heart. The pads that he put on himself are actually pretty small. So the ones that you see in the hospital will be a little bigger than that. Our first priority is getting an IV access so that we can deliver the medications. In the absence of having direct access to his veins, you know, your neck does have big jugular veins that you can potentially have access to. Do we know what it is yet? Ventricular tachycardia, digitalis. They said it was digitalis, which is a heart medication. I think that was a poison. In case of digitalis, there's an antidote. It's called digibind. Sometimes you know from history and you can figure out what the toxin is right away. Sometimes you have to send out some levels and it can take a really long time. <clears throat> when you do deliver the shock, you do see a little bit of a jolt. I think his was a little more exaggerated, but it is there. Realistically, the treatment to ventricular tachycardia and arresting from that is being shocked. He did get shocked pretty quickly after losing his pulses and flatlining. So I think that would have helped anyone. Once you shock somebody back to life, they're still unstable because there's still toxins and there's still poison inside his body. So you wouldn't expect them to be functioning normally and going about their day. But of course he's James Bond. I'm gonna give it a three out of 10. <laughs> I really like this scene. <laughs> Wasp. What's that for? So he's performing an emergency cricothyrotomy, one of the more heroic procedures that gets done sometimes in emergency medicine. So if somebody has a closed airway from allergic reaction or sometimes like even smoke inhalation. One of the ways that you can treat that is by cutting a hole in your throat and then putting a tube in and ventilating the patient that way. I would have probably tried to open the airway first and see if there's anything else. They kind of jumped right into cutting the neck, you know, which is usually our last resort in cases like this. They actually put some alcohol on the neck in an attempt to sterilize the area. So CDC recommends that you use alcohol that's at least 60% to 90% in concentration in order to be able to kill bacteria and viruses. It's not the best way to sterilize instruments or the surgical field, but I think in out in the field when you don't have access to sterile equipment, that's the best thing you can do. So for him to just kind of plop the knife into the neck, I think that's a little unrealistic. There's a lot of important structures in the neck. Make sure you're going in the right place. So you really want to touch and feel the neck anatomy and feel the place where you're going to cut. And normally when we do the procedure, we make one long vertical incision on the neck and then you feel the anatomy and then you can make a smaller incision for the tube to go into. This is an emergency, you know, your airway closes in and you don't have a lot of time. The person is unable to breathe. In cases like this where the throat literally closes in, there's no space for you to be able to be backing the patient or even doing like mouth to mouth. <laughs> Also, if someone is not breathing and someone is unconscious, you want to make sure that they have a pulse. You want to make sure that their heart is beating. And if it's not, you want to do chest compressions to make sure that the blood is circulating to the brain and all the other vital organs. I'm going to give this 6 out of 10. A puncture wound I went deep and nicked the artery. If the doctor hadn't called it a deep wound, 
that nicked the artery, I think the whole scene would have been much more believable. There's a lot of big, important vessels in your neck. If you nicked one of the arteries in your neck, that's a big deal. You're gonna need surgery for that. You don't wanna just close up the top and call it a day because the artery that's nicked is gonna continue to bleed. The doctor was doing simple interrupted stitches, which is individual stitches to close up the wound. That's typically what I would do if somebody had a superficial wound. It obviously takes some time because you're tying off each individual stitches. What John Wick ends up doing is a much faster stitch. What's called a running stitch is what I'm imagining he's doing, where you don't tie off every stitch, but you just keep going throughout the entire length of the wound. One downside of that is if the stitch becomes loose, you basically expose the whole wound and it can become undone. It's very uncomfortable to have to put a needle in and needle out and tie off your stitches without any kind of lidocaine or anything like that. But it's not very deep. You're only getting the skin with the needle. So even though it would be uncomfortable, it's not unreasonable that you would do this without local anesthetic. Doing it in the mirror, I think would take a lot of hand-eye coordination, but it would be possible to do it. Maybe a three out of 10. <laughs> What's the matter? You don't think jockeying papers across a desk is a noble effort for a cop? Typically, I would not take off the glass with my hands because you really want to avoid any additional injuries. You don't really know what you're going to encounter when you put your fingers in your wound. So using something like tweezers or any instrument would probably be better. Put me down for 20. So there's a saying that goes, solution to pollution is dilution. Anytime there's dirt or foreign body or wound, you can use tap water to kind of really flush it out. There's actually research that shows that tap water is just as effective as using sterile saline. Once you take out some of the bigger pieces and you wrap it really well, you should be able to walk on it unless there are some ligamental or any bony injuries and that might make it harder to walk. But if you really had to, you should be able to walk on it and just hobble. I would give it seven out of 10 because I think he did the best he could with the tools available to him, which is just his hands and running water. Okay. Um... No, this isn't me, Logan. So he basically makes an incision on his abdomen, not even on his chest. He has to put his hand through and essentially go through the diaphragm to be able to reach the heart. And that's actually just a lot of damage that you're gonna have to fix later. You're gonna have difficulty breathing that needs to be repaired. So that is not the approach that surgeons would normally take to get to the heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just did a major surgery on himself. There's actually a couple of famous surgeons that did surgery on themselves. There's one that did surgery on himself in Antarctica when he was doing research and didn't have any access to medical care and he had an appendicitis and he knew it was gonna go bad unless he took the appendix out. So he actually performed the surgery on himself in the 60s. I would say obviously these are rare cases and they're exceptions. Uh. <laughs> you can see that his blood pressure is very low. It's 50 something over 30 something. And you can hear the flat line beep, which I feel like is used a lot in movies and TV shows to indicate that the person has died. It essentially means the heart is not beating. He actually flatlined for a little bit and he was still conscious while the flatline beep was happening. <laughs> so you wouldn't be awake and saying somebody's name. You know, you would be unconscious and then dying. One out of 10, just because it's so preposterous that he's doing his own heart surgery go by going through his abdomen and reaching in with his hand, that's just crazy. <laughs> it looks like the character has a penetrating trauma to her lower abdomen. It's a little unclear how much bleeding she's having from that wound itself. The extent of the damage really depends on how deep the glass went and what structures it's affecting. Are there any major blood vessels? Is it the bowel that's being damage from the glass that can lead to a lot of different complications. So one of them would be significant bleeding that can lead to death. The other thing that I'd be worried about is getting an infection. <laughs> 
when there's bleeding, you want to put pressure on the bleeding. So I think she did the right thing by wrapping herself. In her situation where she doesn't have access to a hospital or medical care, I think leaving that in there could potentially cause more damage just because every time you bump into something, it can cause deeper damage. It is a wound that you could potentially die from. Blood loss and the amount of blood that you see in TVs and movies, it's always more jarring and always really leaves a lasting impact on your mind. But often, as long as it is controlled, bleeding is stopped and the injuries are fixed, it's often okay to see a lot of blood. Your body will make up that lost blood. This was maybe a six out of 10. We often cut patients' clothes off. You want to make sure there's no other injuries to the body. But if they're able to walk and stand on their own, we usually just have patients take off their pants instead of cutting them. Because, you know, it's nice to be able to save the clothing if you can. In his case, I think maybe there's just a lot of dried blood and maybe it would have been painful for him to like peel off the pants. I think the warm bath is just to wash off the dried blood. We don't submerge wounds in the emergency room. I think that can be a nidus for an infection probably, so you don't want to be soaking in potentially dirty water. I really like what he's doing with the saline bottle. He mixed in betadine and basically made a solution that he can wash out his wound with. I actually often do that with my saline bottles also. So if I don't have a spray cap, I'll poke some holes on the cap of the saline bottle to make it into a spray bottle. He was injecting some lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic. It would be hard to see, and you probably have to do a little bit of digging to visualize all the fragments and foreign bodies. That's where the lidocaine comes in really handy because you don't want to be digging in. That's really uncomfortable with the lidocaine, then you can do a little more exploring. In cases of gunshot wounds, we'll often take an x-ray to see what fragments are left inside the body. One fun thing that we sometimes do is whenever there's a bullet entry, we'll tape a paper clip to the wound site so that when we take an x-ray, we can know exactly where that is. So we can kind of determine where is the entry wound and where is the exit wound. This one, I thought he did a really great job. He also had access to a lot of like real medical equipments and medication. So I would give it eight out of 10. This scene is really difficult to watch. He has a crush injury and now he's making the difficult decision to amputate his own arm. He's applying essentially a tourniquet to his arm. The purpose of that is to prevent the blood flow. There are big arteries that goes through your arm to supply blood to your forearm and your hands and you don't want to go through the whole pain of amputating your own arm if you're going to die from the blood loss so you want to tightly tie off the tourniquet so that it cuts off the blood supply to the rest of your distal arm. He has like a carabiner that he twists on itself to make the tourniquet even tighter. And that's pretty similar to what a real tourniquet looks like. There's a plastic part where you can twist off to make it even tighter. That is a very small knife to be cutting your arm with. Typically amputations are done in a very controlled setting in the operating room not in the emergency room. They probably have a bone saw rather than having to break your own arm. Your muscle breaks down and you can go into rhabdomyolysis and you can damage your kidneys, your kidneys can shut down. You can have a systemic illness from a crush injury like this. So the longer he stays in that position, the worse it is. Not to mention the dehydration that he's going through because he doesn't have access to water. So this is really just survival, it's life and death. <sighs> I love the audio of what it feels like to really aggravate that nerve. If you've ever had like a pinched nerve in your elbow, you know it's like a very electrical, like zinging kind of pain. So you can just imagine directly touching the nerve and imagine what that feels like. So I thought they did a really great job combining the audio and the visual. If it were me, because I know the nerve is gonna be more sensitive, I would just cut it as fast as I can. I think he's trying to overcome that with his like mental strength of 
telling himself, don't pass out, don't pass out. If the tourniquet is on correctly, then hopefully the bleeding will be a lot slower and hopefully it wouldn't be to the point where he passes out and continues to bleed and then basically dies from blood loss. You know, I think in terms of passing out from pain, that really depends on the person. Everyone has a different threshold. I thought they did a great job, actually. I would give this like nine out of 10. And I'm sure part of that is because I know that this really happened. <laughs> You could see a lot of swelling, and even his face looks a little more swollen on that side. There's probably a lot of inflammation and potentially an abscess underneath. It happens. People do, from time to time, come to the emergency room, and often it's obvious that the tooth just needs to come out. Um, I can't imagine having to do that to myself. If you're using a skate to take out the tooth, you risk partially breaking the tooth or injuring other structures around. Risky, but I think in his case, he had no access to dentists. I think you could use something similar, like a sharp pointy knife. If the tooth broke off and it was still there, and now he has less of a leverage to use the skate to take out the tooth, so if it was partially broken and then infection would still be there. He passed out at the end, I would imagine the pain is pretty strong. You can probably pass out from that kind of pain. No, no. <laughs> Dental procedures at home, definitely not recommended. <laughs> Seven out of 10, I think it's a reasonable attempt given his circumstances. Just located my shoulder though, hold me. Most of the shoulder dislocations are anterior dislocations, meaning the shoulder joint comes out to the front and then you wanna mimic the injury to be able to put back in. So there's a lot of like pulling down and then kind of putting it back into the socket. You need some counter traction. So I think it helps to have somebody either pull or for you to have something to push against before you put the shoulder back in. <sighs> Better. There's actually a very wide range of presentations when it comes to shoulder dislocation. It is one of the common things that we see in the emergency room. As many people know, sometimes people get shoulder dislocations frequently and they're able to kind of pop it back in themselves or it spontaneously goes back in and they never have to come to the hospital. In some cases, whether it's someone's first time or it's just not going back in, it stays out and it can actually be pretty uncomfortable. And you know, everyone's tolerance of pain is different. So Certain patients, they can use their arm normally right away. For them, it happens a lot frequently and they can kind of deal with it. For some people, we put them in a sling and we tell them, you know, don't move it until you can go see your orthopedic doctor. She's strong and she has good control of her body, so she probably knows what she can do and can't do. I would give it a four out of 10 just because I don't know if the motion that she used to put back her shoulder was necessarily the correct motion. Thank you for watching, that's all we have. And if you enjoyed this video, check out some of the videos above.